All right, friends, good evening. Welcome to the Gospel of Peace tonight. My name is Jerry Robinson. It's great to have you here tonight. We have a really good night tonight lined up. We're going to be talking about some really important things as we have going through this series, the Gospel of Peace, really focused upon exploring the depths of Scripture and delving into the very heart of God's call for us as followers of Jesus. As we choose Jesus, we walk in the way of Jesus, and therefore we want to know how do we look like Jesus? What does Jesus expect? What does he ask of us? What does he command? And while we may mess up and we may fall down and we may not always look like Jesus, that there's always a way back. There's always a way back. The Father is always outside waiting for that prodigal son to come home. No matter who's listening to me tonight, no matter where you come from, no matter what kind of heartbreak you've had, no matter what kind of pain you felt, no matter what kind of sorrow and tragedy, that God is the God of second chances and God is God who heals. He is a protector. He's a loving daddy that you can run into his arms. You can find wisdom and strength in the loving arms of your Heavenly Father. I want to stress to you tonight the goodness of God. As I was preparing for tonight's um, teaching, I was outside looking, and I had the most beautiful sunset to look at, and I was just simply in awe and amazed at God's creation, at God's handiwork. Just a loving, beautiful symbol in the sky showing his greatness, his vastness, his creativity. A beautiful sunset. And then I had the opportunity just about we uh, about a week ago to experience the eclipse with the totality. And it was such a marvelous and incredible and quite frankly, a, a difficult experience to describe because it was so awesome in every sense of the word. It was awesome. And so we're reminded tonight that we serve a good God, a kind God, a loving God, a God who forgives, a God whose mercy endures forever, a God we can run to, a God we can trust, a God that understands us, who has been tested like us in all different ways. And because he overcame the world, we can overcome the world tonight. So we're very grateful to have you here for the Gospel of Peace. We have a lot to talk about. We're going to continue uh, in the God and Guns topic that we have been doing for some time. Uh, we actually went through this the last time we got together. We did take a week off. Tonight, we're going to be continuing God and Guns. We're, gonna, we're going to conclude that, and then we're going to move into the new uh, segment called War and Peace. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but we're going to be talking about God and Guns tonight. We'll We'll certainly have a lot to say about that. But I wanted to begin tonight's teaching with a profile of someone who actually followed Jesus when it come when it came to nonviolence. And th what I what I have found so unbelievably encouraging is to go back and to study brothers and sisters of the Christian faith traditions who have given their lives and actually taken Jesus seriously when it comes to nonviolent resistance. And so instead of saying, well, this all sounds impossible, or this is all sounds, you know, really great, but you know, how can we actually put this into practice? Well, there are many examples, friends, and we need to uh, examine them. I believe if as believers, we should celebrate the lives and the courage of those who have gone before us who have heard the words of Jesus and at their own peril, at their own hurt, uh, follow Jesus when it mattered most. And so tonight, I just want a very quickly, very quick profile of Maximilian Kolbe, who was a Polish Franciscan friar during World War II. And he was in the Auschwitz concentration camp. And it was there <clears throat> where he was serving and he offered his life in the place of a stranger who was selected to die by starvation. Um, and that, that person was set to be punished because they had tried to escape, and they were going to kill the man by starvation. 
And Colby's act of sacrificial love is just as simply a profound testament of the Christian call to lay down one's life for others. He showed nonviolent resistance to the evil of the Holocaust, and he demonstrated the power of the Christ-like love and sacrifice that left an incredible impact on the, the camp survivors and upon the world at large whenever his story became known. So he volunteered, Colby volunteered to die in the place of a stranger in the Auschwitz concentration camp during World War II. And tonight, I just want to profile his courage as he relied upon Jesus and looks incredibly like Jesus as we think about how Jesus laid down his life for others. Tonight, as we go through, we're going to remind you a notebook and a pen for anything that you might think of, any notes, any reflections you have during the discussion. Secondly, to come with an open heart and mind, uh, to bring questions and curiosity. Uh, I may say things that may trigger you to have a question or a comment. Feel free to share that. And then also just an eagerness to learn. We've worked hard to put together material to share with you. We pray that you would display an eagerness to learn and be ready uh, with a desire to grow in your understanding of nonviolence. So last week or last time we got together, we talked about Luke twenty two thirty six, where Jesus says, any man who doesn't have a sword, let him let, or let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. And we talked about, does Jesus command his followers to carry a sword? And we spent some time talking about that. And our conclusion was simply that we have to ask the question, was Jesus calling his disciples to a life of violence and bloodshed after spending his entire ministry calling them to nonviolence? And we would say that, no, that, that doesn't sound like what Jesus would be doing. He wouldn't be overturning his whole ministry, all of the work of his ministry, uh, simply to turn around and tell the men to put their swords away for those who live by them will die by them. So he clearly rejects the sword in the Garden of Gethsemane, and in disarming Peter, as Tertullian says, he disarmed every Christian. So we now turn in tonight's teaching, God and guns. You know, guns, I'm just going to be frank with you, they are these items that we turn to that in some way, shape, or form provide some sort of semblance of trust. They they serve as deceptive saviors, right? So you can take someone else's life, but still lose your own, right? So in other words, the gun seems to indicate in some way it plays a role as a deceptive savior to cause or tempt Christians to misplace their trust. That's, that's the thesis. And we have to admit that Americans love guns. Today, people from around the world stand in horror at the growing gun violence in America. And many are asking how the world's richest country could possibly lead the developed world in the annual number of gun deaths. Why can't the land of the free and the home of the brave stop killing its own with machines of death? And what puzzles the world maybe even more is why America seems to be in denial about the destructive nature of its gun culture. You know, firearms today have become the number one cause of death for American children. And that should simply be unacceptable. That America's gun culture represents a state of emergency is confirmed by the fact that more Americans have died from domestic gunfire since 1968 than died in all the war wars of this country's history. So mass shooting shootings have simply become a common occurrence in America. And we have to ask, why have Americans and their lawmakers been so ineffective at halting the ongoing massacre of themselves and of their children? And what I want to suggest to you tonight is that the reason why America appears so incredibly powerless in the face of rising gun violence is largely due to a faulty theological proposition that is embraced by America in its infancy. And that America's faulty theological underpinnings towards violence and machines of death have seduced its citizens and prevented them from taking action. So what I'm saying is, is that I believe the truth is America's gun problem has much more to do with poor theology 
or perhaps as much to do with poor theology as it has to do with politics. You see, the Second Amendment is believed by Americans to contain the right given by God, not man. And here's the truth. America believes the right to keep and bear arms, as enshrined in the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, is given by God, not man. That is, America's God is a dealer in carnal weapons. That is, the God of America defends man's right to harness machines of death in settling disputes with their enemies. Now, when we believe that God is Jesus and that Jesus is God, well, then we say, well, no, that doesn't sound like any God that I'm aware of, right? That doesn't sound like Jesus. I mean, who believes for a moment that the God of America, who is open to you having, who, who specifically wants to arm you, against tyrants who specifically offers you weapons you know so uh anyway here's an image here's an image that we'll just we can look at we can stare at we can just think about in all of this context here we have a picture of two people uh and their names really aren't important. This is just a meme that's taken off of the internet. But it tells the whole story. It tells the whole story. That we often look at, as Christians, let's say, living here in the West, we often look at Islam, and we think to ourselves, well, there's a violent religion. You know, there's a religion where they are told to go hurt people for God. Right? And we find some sort of moral superiority in that. We, we look at Islam and we say, you know, I'm just speaking from experience as a Western Christian growing up in America, you know, uh, the 9-11 generation. Looking at the Muslim who has a gun and a Quran and saying, well, you know, God doesn't look like that. But then when we see the left-hand image, of an American holding a Bible and a firearm, it feels more innocent. And my point to you is, is that it, it always is innocent, depending on which side you're on. Right? So it all depends which side you're on. And if this is unacceptable for the Muslim, then it's definitely unacceptable for the Christian. Can we at least admit this? Are gun rights God-given? If so... Does God extend these same rights to all people? Does he extend them to just Christians, or are gun rights for Christians and for non-Christians? Because Christians believe that Jesus is God, and it follows that American Christians believe the right to a firearm comes directly from Jesus. And this is a vital point to grasp. I mean, namely, America's Jesus-given gun rights vainly imagine that the Prince of Peace specifically grants a right to all men, especially his own followers, to bear carnal weapons so that they can have an equal opportunity to gun down their enemies before their enemy can gun them down. Now, these are Jesus-given gun rights. Now, we have to ask ourselves, are these gun rights God-given? Did God really hand these down from heaven? Because when you look at uh, the, the modern culture, you'll find that this is what is believed. It's part of the uh, American mythos. Certainly part of our learning and understanding that these rights are given to us not by government, but by God. That God has given us the right. And when we say God, we can't forget who we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus. So Jesus, the Prince of Peace, has given us the right to carry a gun and use it against our enemies. He just wanted to butt into our world and let us know that we could carry guns if we wanted to. That was just one final thing that he wanted to add. After he added what he said, in the Gospels, he had one more thing. He said, look, and also, by the way, hey, if you want to shoot your enemies, don't let me get in your way.
So let's think about it this way. God doesn't give evil gifts. And if we can think of any invention of evil, we would have to say that it is a gun, certainly a nuclear bomb, certainly a plutonium bomb, a hydrogen bomb, any kind of munitions. We would think, well, of course, these are weapons. These are inventions of evil. If there are any inventions of evil, how are these not qualifying? And firearms, which are designed specifically and only to kill fellow human beings, they're literally machines of death and serve no other purpose. You can pick at your teeth with a knife. You can you know, cut some rope with a sword, right? Your gun literally has nothing to do except homicidal violence. That's the only purpose of the gun. It serves no other purpose. How could there be a more obvious invention of death? and an invention of evil by the same token. So we would say, well, certainly guns are, are evil. They're, they won't be in the New Jerusalem. We can promise you that. How come? Because they're evil. So God doesn't give evil gifts. He's not dispensing evil gifts. And by the way, if these gifts are handed to us by, by Jesus, well, since when do we have to kill to receive these gifts? We have the gifts of the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace, and we have to kill for those? We don't have to kill to get those, do we? So what, what right or, or what gift has God given us that we should kill for? And we would say, well, maybe our liberty to congregate, they would say. Maybe our free speech, they would say. Maybe our Second Amendment rights, they would say. Maybe, that, maybe that's enough to give me to pull the trigger and act like Jesus never existed. So God doesn't give evil gifts. Now, how do we know this? Well, we know this because of James, the book of James chapter 1, and the Scripture tells the story, but in James chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, here's what James says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift. What kinds of gifts? Good and perfect, that's all. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Now, like I had said, I can think of nothing that makes it easier for a common man to do violence and violate what Jesus has said about loving enemies than with a gun. And so if we're truly following Jesus, and that, that's our goal, and obviously that's what we all desire— it's difficult. It's hard. But if we really want to follow the Lord, we have to ask ourselves, how can we be duped into believing that our Father has given us machines of death? Do not be deceived, the Scripture says. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, who never changes. There's no changing. No changing. God gives good gifts, not evil gifts. But we have to ask ourselves, are we to understand that the New Testament's call for Christians to live a life marked by love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control also includes a spiritual mandate to be armed to the teeth just in case? We, we have to think to ourselves that what we have here is that we have some sort of misunderstanding about God. The problem here, of course, is in thinking that Jesus is somehow double-minded. You know, Christ explicitly commanded his followers to love and not kill or maim their enemies. Who can, who, who can claim to be ignorant of that fact? The irony is that we often see many of those who are the loudest in proclaiming that man's laws do not trump God's laws often flipping that even though the state condones certain acts of homicidal violence with carnal weapons Jesus doesn't 
And the point here is that Christians must ultimately answer to Jesus, not the state, for their actions. We're not responsible for keeping laws that are incongruent with Christ's commands, even if some claim that they have been sent from on high. James also tells us in the book of, uh, first book of James, uh, the first chapter 13 and 14, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. God doesn't tempt us with evil, and he cannot be tempted with evil. So if we were ever tempted in any way, shape, or form, it is not God who tempts us. God is not the tempter. There is a tempter, but God is not the tempter. Now, we can go further and say we know that the weapons of our warfare as believers are not carnal. So the New Testament never condones the idea that Christians would use carnal weapons to engage in homicidal violence against their enemies. New Testament never condones the idea of Christians engaging in homicidal violence against their enemies. But we can't choose homicidal violence without denying our only master who commands us not to even hate our enemies, not to even sue them at law. How are we supposed to plunge a knife into their belly? The, by the way, the only carnal weapons available to Christ's disciples belong to their adversary. It's the enemy who traffics in weapons and machines of death. It's not God. God traffics, if we want to use that phrase, in weapons of light. He traffics in weapons of light. But we have today carnal weapons, which are idols. They are deceptive saviors of mankind. And they are antichrist in design. If we, def if we define a false god as something we trust in to protect us when all else fails, then guns qualify. If we define a false god or an idol as something we trust in to protect us when all else fails, guns would qualify. They are deceptive saviors. We are told specifically in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. So the way of Christ is the way of peace. It's not the way of violence with carnal weapons. And we can say, well... We're not planning on plotting any kind of violence. We're just going to have one just in case. Well, the idea here is, is that the cycle of violence will never end then. The stats are clear. The number, the person who is going to be shot with a gun in your home is most likely going to be you or one or one of your family members in the home. That those are the hard facts. They're deceptive saviors. We live in a world enamored with the might of guns, with the might of bombs. And the supposed security they promise. But our battle is not against the flesh and blood, and our weapons are not of this world. And they are spiritual. They are grounded in love, and they are grounded in truth. They're grounded in wisdom. They're grounded in re redemptive power of the gospel. The true security, true peace does not come through the barrel of a gun. It comes from living in the fullness of God's will of peace and reconciliation and love, even in the face of hostility. And our divided world right now needs agents of peace much more than it needs more guns. But we are locked in a cycle of fear, and fear is bred by ignorance. And when we fear, we hate, and when we hate, we fight. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly uh, places. 
And of course, the scripture goes on and tells us to put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the feet shod with peace and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And these are all spiritual weapons. There are no carnal weapons on that list. God has not empowered us, endued us, equipped us with any carnal weapons. In fact, he has told us to put them down. Now, there's a problem with all of this teaching. You know it and I know it. All sounds fine until you get to the Old Testament. You look at the New Testament, you listen to the words of Jesus, and you say, I, I'm with you, I can hear you. But when you go back into the Old Testament, you're going to find the pages are soaked in blood. You're going to find the blood of righteous Abel. And you're going to find the blood from all the human violence in the days of Noah. And you're going to find the blood of bulls and goats and oxen offered in sacrifice. And you're going to find the blood of many peoples, including the Canaanites and the Amalekites and the Jebusites, and on and on. The Old Testament is filled with blood. We have to ask ourselves a question. We have to ask, was God nonviolent until man became violent? When we take a sur simple surface reading of the Old Testament, it appears that God was nonviolent until man became violent. And God was at peace, he was at rest, he had made all the world nonviolently, he had made man, everything was nonviolent, and that God was nonviolent until man changes God. So we have to ask the question, was God nonviolent until man came along and changed God and made him violent? And then is he going to go back to being nonviolent? You and I better hope so. If he's planning on being violent, I don't think anybody, why would you be looking forward to the new Jerusalem? If he never changes and he's violent, well, guess what? It's just one plus two. If he never changes and he's violent, guess what? He'll always be violent. So was God nonviolent until man became violent, then God got violent? Did man change God? Can we disturb God? Can we get God out of his peace? Can we cause God not to love or to love in a way that causes uh, death and suffering? Causes, literally promotes, seeks out death and suffering for, man, for mankind. Is that what we believe God does? Well, we have to ask ourselves. I mean, so, some Christian denominations teach that God poured out his wrath on Christ and they say that that explains why we now live in an age of grace. But the Bible seems to challenge some of the concepts of that idea. Consider these inspired words by the Apostle Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Listen to these words. Therefore, Paul writes, Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, I want to stress this, this part here in the, in the text where it says, before time began, and then it says, now been revealed. Okay, so let's pay attention to that and go back one more time and look at this. It says, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us, given freely to us in Christ Jesus, before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing 
of our Savior Jesus Christ. So it was already given to us before time began. It was according to His own purpose and His own grace. And it was given to us before time began, but has now been revealed. So the act of revealing something doesn't mean that it's born that moment. It doesn't mean that it becomes true when it's revealed. It's a truth that is already and that is revealed. So the truth that Jesus came to reveal was not that God was might be willing to forgive them. He had come telling them that God, before time began, had he had forgiven them, and he was revealing it. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Who doesn't want love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control? Who doesn't? Well, they can stand outside all day long, but her gates will never shut. We read about in the New Jerusalem. So from before time began, according to his own purpose and grace, God gave us what? Salvation and a calling. Before time began, it was given to us. And it has now been revealed. It has not now suddenly come into force. It is not, the age of grace has not just suddenly imagined, you know, suddenly beginning now. Suddenly God is now being gracious to us. No, God had always been gracious to us but since before time began, but now Jesus was revealing that fact that had always been. He didn't change God. He came to change us. Many of us teach Many of us, I've, I've, when I say many of us, I've heard many times in churches where the teaching goes something along the lines of, you know, God was very angry with everybody, and the only way that he could be satisfied was if he got his pound of flesh. You know, he wants you to forgive your enemy 70 times 7, but you don't get that. And so there's got to be eye for eye for you. And but we're not to do eye for an eye, but he does. Well, that's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says God does not do retaliation, that retaliation is not his will, and that when we do retaliation against our enemies, we don't look like God. But we seem to have the idea that God needed his pound of flesh, and so therefore he took it out on Jesus, and that somehow this was like, you know, just just thinking about it in, in pagan terms, the way pagans might view it, would be like you know a a a woman a a virgin dressed in white being thrown into a volcano to satiate the the angry you know gurgling vol volcano and uh, the innocent white dressed virgin is cast into the volcano and it satiates the anger of the volcano. This is pagan. This is a pagan idea. This, These are all pagan ideas. So God is not like a burgeoning volcano who needs to be satiated. He can't control himself. He's about to go out of control because you won't listen to him. And because you won't listen to him, he's going to explode upon you. That is not God. That is not God. That's not who Jesus reveals. The one who Jesus revealed according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us before time began, he saved us and called us with a holy calling. Before time began. Before time began. Before you had before you started nosing around in the whole thing. Before you had any input in it. Before time began. But it was revealed to us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. It was revealed to us through Jesus. It was not, it didn't get activated with Jesus. It was already activated. It had always been. So Jesus was not here on a mission to change God. God's grace was revealed in Jesus. In other words, God's grace was ours before time began, and that is the merciful age of grace that we often talk about, that we live in today is not some sort of 
new development. It's a new revelation. It, it's a revelation to us that God is gracious, that God is this gracious. But rather, God's grace toward man has always been, before time began, and will always be, for God does not change. So instead of viewing our common era as a new age of grace, so to speak, which was preceded by an age of law, right? This is a simple way of thinking about it. Paul encourages us to view it as an age that finally understands God's grace. It's not some new age of grace. It's an age that finally comprehends what has been revealed about God's grace, that God's grace never uh, changed from the beginning of time, that His mercy endures forever, that His wrath is for but for a moment, but His mercy endures forever. So God's loving and merciful character did not change because of your sins. His loving and merciful character did not change because of my sins. That we are not changing God. God is changing us. You see, we have, it's like an inverted mirror. We have to be careful. We can project upon God, and we can project upon Him. I've certainly done it. Uh, it's something I think that's probably common with humanity, is we project upon God what we, what we think, maybe even about ourselves. So it, it wasn't man's character that changed as a result of sin. It was man's perception of God, perhaps more importantly than the character. It was man's perception of God, not God himself, that changed once the light of Christ brought life and truth. So our perception of God is what's at stake. Our perception of God, who is God? That's the question tonight. Who is God? Because whatever you answer to that is going to color your life. If you believe that God looks like Moses and what Moses said, well, you're going to have a certain belief system. If you believe that he is, you believe that he is fully revealed by Muhammad, then you're going to have a, it's going to color your worldview. And if you believe that Jesus is the only way to God, then that's also going to color your worldview, right? So it's important, I want to say this, God's grace towards man didn't begin at Jesus's first coming. God's grace towards man was revealed to us by Jesus's first coming, right? That God, many people will look at the cross and they'll say, where, where was God in all of that? When you see Jesus on, the, on Calvary, you say, there's Jesus and there's the soldiers and there's Mary and the disciples standing afar off. There's the other two other men who were hanging up on the crosses. They say, where's God? And the Scripture tells us perfectly that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself. He was not outside of Jesus. He was right there in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself. That God was in Christ. That was the mystery that Paul talked about. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Man's view of God is warped. This is Satan's doing. Satan desires and delights to destroy our Heavenly Father's reputation. Satan longs to have you believe falsely about God and His character. Satan wants you to believe a lie about God. In fact, that's exactly what we read in the book of Revelation. It talks about how he wants to be God. He's always wanted to be God, and so he plays God. And he's going to try to trick people into believing that he is God. Why? Why has he spent his time doing this? Because he wants to defame who God is. He wants to defile and blaspheme the way of truth. He wants to lie about who God is. So if he comes along and says that he's God, well, guess what? You're going to think God looks like that. And if that doesn't look like Jesus, well, then that's not God. And that's why it's called Antichrist, is because the one who comes and the ones who come teach the opposite of Jesus. It's not that spooky. You know, it's not some sort of, uh, you know, weird tattoo. It's not some sort of gadget in your head. Listen, it has to do with being antichrist. That is, you're against love. You're against joy. You're against peace. You're against patience. You're against kindness. You're against goodness. You're against self-control. You're against mercy. Okay? This is what antichrist is. Antichrist takes away the glass of water, doesn't give the glass of water. 
It robs the people of their clothes. It doesn't take give them clothes. It puts them in the hospital. It doesn't visit them in the hospital. This is what Antichrist is. Antichrist, you know, uh, it's the opposite of Jesus. We don't need to make it any more spooky than that. It's literally not loving your neighbor. And you want to know what Antichrist is? It's the opposite of love. It's hate. We got lots of hate in the world. We got lots of Antichrist in the world. It's the same thing. When your motivation is hate, well, that's, you know, we know, the, we know who the father of hate is. We know who the father of lies is. We know who the father of killing is. We know who the father of murder is. We know who the father of stealing is. And it's not our father. But he's, but Satan is hell-bent to get you to blame God for it. You know when you go back in the Old Testament and you look in the Old Testament, you see that Satan killed nine people. Who killed the rest? Who killed the rest? You look in the pages of the Old Testament and say, well, how many people did Satan kill? You say, well, I got, uh, you know, Job, and I got, you know, I guess nine. And well, God says God killed the rest of the people. So God killed millions and Satan killed nine. Well, who's afraid of Satan? Why are they telling us to be worried about Satan? That's kind of a good question, isn't it? Sort of. What about Satan? We're going to get to what about Satan in our final session. We've got a doozy of a capstone for this teaching series. And it's going to fully expose, I think, Satan's tactics. Uh, that is that he desires to malign God's character. So because of sin, man developed a warped view of God and projected all of their own sins upon God. So because sinful man was violent, it was assumed that God too was violent. And because sinful man was murderous, well, it was assumed that God too was murderous. And because sinful man demanded an eye for an eye, well, it was assumed that God demanded the same. And because man felt like he needed to kill something to get close to God, well, that's what God wanted. How do you know? What, what do you know? So many Christians today believe that God changed his mind or repented regarding his violence against mankind by pouring out the wrath that we deserve upon his own son at the cross. And according to this logic, God is no longer mad now at mankind because Jesus was willing to bear the horrific brunt of God's wrath in our place. Now, I believe that Jesus stood in our place, and I believe in the substitution of Jesus. But what I'm suggesting to you is, is that when we believe that God changed his mind, we have made, I believe, what would be an error. When we read in the book of, say, Genesis chapter 6, where it says that, you know, God flooded the whole earth, and then he's like, then he, or then he first he changed his mind and said, you know, I'm sorry, I made these people. And then he wipes them all out. And then he changes his mind again and says, you know, I'm not going to do that again. Okay, well, that requires a little more reading. And we don't get to just breeze through that and say, oh, okay, well, God changed his mind, and then he uh, killed everybody, and then he decided he wasn't going to do that again with water. Okay, no, whoa, 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 whoa. Does God look like Jesus or not? So you're not walking back to Genesis 6 without Jesus, right? We're not going back there and saying God doesn't look like Jesus until he throws Jesus into the volcano. No, God always looks like Jesus. He always, he's, he's never not looked like Jesus. So our view of God is what's warped. We're the ones who have warped views. So it's man that needs to repent, not God. So let me suggest that this interpretation misunderstands the true nature and character of God we've been talking about with this view of Jesus on the cross, is that the view that God was sometimes nonviolent and that other times became violent when we became violent confuses the nature of God with man's sinful nature. In truth, God has always been perfect and has never been, even for a moment, imperfect. It was mankind that was once perfect, Adam and Eve, but then became imperfect through sin. So God didn't wasn't perfect and then became imperfect and then had to get perfect again. He wasn't lacking something in himself that Jesus had to fix. Jesus didn't fix God, he fixed us. God has always been perfect. Man has not always been perfect. There's only a few instances in the Bible where man is perfect. You have, you know, the first two chapters of the Bible, Adam and Eve. The, the, then you have the Gospels presenting Jesus as the second Adam, who is the second perfect man to walk the earth, calling all men to perfection. 
And then the third, you have the last two chapters of Revelation where all mankind is redeemed and restored to perfection in the new heavens and the new earth. And in all three of these accounts of man's perfection, man is seen as nonviolent, like God. Adam and Eve were nonviolent, they were perfect. Jesus Christ was nonviolent, he was perfect. Those living under God's kingdom rule in the new heavens and the new earth are nonviolent, they're perfect. God didn't change, man changed. God did not become violent, man became violent. The cross changes our minds, not God's mind. Jesus' violent death on the cross at the hands of sinful men was not seeking to change God's mind about man. Instead, the cross of Christ forever settled the true source of violence in order to change man's mind about God. The cross was never about changing God's mind concerning humanity. It was never a means to appease a wrathful father or to alter his perceptions of us. On the contrary, the cross was about revealing the truth to us about God and about our, our own nature. It was a divine strategy, not to modify God's understanding of man, but to transform man's understanding of God. And so God and his wisdom and his unchanging nature chose the way of the cross to address and dismantle our misconceptions. He, he used what was meant for evil, this brutal instrument of execution, to display the greatest act of love. Jesus absorbed the fullness of human violence without retaliation, without malice. We see God most clearly at the cross. Jesus embodying forgiveness and grace under the most extreme conditions imaginable. And this violent act committed against Jesus did not prompt a change in God's character. God is, was, and always will be love. Instead, what that moment on the cross did was it highlighted the stark difference between the divine love and the and human sin so the cross serves as a mirror reflecting not god's violence but our own and god's response to that which was grace and forgiveness always reconciliation so brad jerzak who wrote a great book I'm going to tell you about in a minute, uh, has this really simple illustration where he shows two chairs. Before the fall in Eden, man and God were facing each other. Everything's good. Man's perfect, made in God's image. God, of course, is perfect. But after the fall in Eden, man turns his chair away from God, no longer seeing God, not able to really see God himself, not able to even really see God's expressions, completely oblivious to God, his chair completely turned around. This is where man was after the fall in Eden. But then after Christ's ministry, Jesus came to turn that chair of man back around to God, so man could rightly see God. That man was not rightly seeing God until Jesus fixed man. Jesus did not turn God's chair around. God's chair was not turned around from us, and he said, I can't stand to look at him. Jesus, you go fix it. Okay, that's not how at all. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ. There's no one hiding behind Jesus' back. God was in Christ, reconciling man unto himself, and God and man facing together after Jesus Christ's ministry, that we can rightly see God now. How do we see God now when we didn't before? We have Jesus. Really great illustration on the gospel. I love that gospel in chairs. You can read uh, Bradley Jerzak's book, Her Gates Will Never Be Shut. It's simply a beautiful book on the uh, New Jerusalem. Next week, we're going to be getting into the topic of war and peace. That's going to be uh, the next topic that we're going to be tackling. Of course, there's a lot of uh, sad things to talk about, Christian bloodshed in the name of God. We're going to be talking about the biblical view of the American Revolution. Uh, a time of bloodshed uh, occurring as Christians in America took up the sword against their brothers and countrymen, their fellow British Christians. Put simply, the American Revolution led to Christian-on-Christian -Christian bloodshed. Brother took up arms against his fellow Christian brother. All done, by the way, in the name of God, then we have, of course, the Civil War, we'll address briefly, which was fought over God-given states' rights. We've kind of touched on that topic tonight of God-given rights. 
well, it's God-given rights that are going to lead us to, to pick up these firearms afforded to us by God in the Second Amendment and point them at fellow Christian believers over those same rights that we wanted to defend. And many of these rights, you know, well, one of the rights was included the right to traffic and chattel slavery. So this was one of the rights that, of course, in the main right that was being considered at the time of the Civil War, which led to 400,000 Americans killed uh, on both North and South. You had Christian believers. World War I was Christian on Christian bloodshed. World War II was Christian on Christian bloodshed. Protestants are very fond of looking back, uh, you know, to the times of the Crusades and thinking, oh, well, you know, there was a time whenever uh, Crusaders picked up swords and they went and they tried to liberate Jerusalem from the Muslims, and they killed in the name of God. Well, you know, I would say the Protestants have their own crusades. We can call them World War I. We can call them World War II. We can call them various revolutions that have occurred through time. Christian on Christian bloodshed fills history books. It's not called that. We don't see it that way. We just see it as defending our ground or defending our rights that God has given to us. Yeah, that's, that's it. But we have to look at it and say, is that really what's happening here? We read the book of Revelation, we see a lot of bloodshed. Are we so sure that it's God doing the bloodshed, or is it someone else? Sounds like we got that part, that department handled ourselves pretty well. The sad thing is, is that we are due for probably another civil war. Another revolt in America is all but certain. Political polarization is soaring. Americans are divided again over rights, right? Right, different rights. The people are saying, I have a right to this, and I have a right to that, and these people are mean because they won't give me that right, or, 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 or that they're, they're, they're against this or that, and they need to be stopped, and now we all have guns, and so maybe we can make it stop, right? And once again, Christians will be forced to take sides, right? So this is why we're teaching this. I want to conclude tonight by pointing out that we live in a time now where this teaching that I'm doing is very unpopular. I've said this a few times. There are many ways for us to do very popular teachings. There would be things that I could say, there would be topics that I could focus upon that would be very sensational, that would be very uh, commercialized, and that would draw a very large crowd because people want to hear about certain things. Do you know what people don't want to hear about? Their own sins. They're very eager to hear about other people's sins. So if I would bring up topics about immigrants, or if I would bring up topics about abortion, or if I would talk about uh, politics, or if I would spend, spend time talking about things that you've been told to the media propagandists that is important, then, you know, it would seem like, well, hey, you know, Jerry really got the smarts. He really understands what's at stake, you know? The guy finally starting to get it. He realizes it's not about violence. It's not about this thing with Jesus and love and enemies. That's like a minor point. Come on. We all know it's the communists, Jerry. It's the communists that are driving the world into the, into the hell hole. We got to stop them, man. Don't you see? Don't you see what's at stake, Jerry? Can't you see what's at stake? Don't you know? Don't you know what Fox News said, Jerry? Don't you know what they said on Twitter yesterday, Jerry? Don't you know? Yeah. Well, here's the problem with all of that. The problem with all of that is that we're preparing for another civil war in this country. And all of those things, and all of those ideas, and all of those philosophies, and all of that stuff, will all go up in flames whenever we do what we do best in this country, and that is revolt with violence. And who thinks it's not coming again? I mean, there's even a movie. There's a movie out this month called Civil War, written and directed by Alex Garland. It's a doomsday kind of movie showing the United States descending into civil war. 
how would this be a surprise? How would this not be part of the script? We are committed to violence. We are committed to guns. We believe God gave us rights, and we believe that he gave us guns. You do the math. This is a vital teaching. This is a vital teaching. The things that we're talking about here about gun violence and what Jesus says are the exact opposite things that are going to be promoted during a civil war. I encourage you to read James P. Byrd's book, Sacred Scripture, Sacred War. Oh, I spent many nights uh, staying up late, just couldn't put this book down, reading through the Bible and the American Revolution. And it talks about how the preachers were used greatly to stir the mobs to war. They didn't want to kill. They knew they were going to be killing Christians. They needed religious sanction to kill their Christian fellow brothers and sisters from across the pond. And the preachers were lining up there, giving them Old Testament verses, saying, see, Samson killed a bunch of people, so you can do it. And they started giving them verses. David was a mighty warrior. you got to go kill that Christian. Okay, so you find out how it works. In World War I, World War II, these were all blessed and sanctioned by the church. Right? Vietnam, sanctioned by the church. All these wars. They're all, there's, they've never met an, un, an unjust war. So you know, we, we have wars all the time. Well, how does it work? Well, there's a, there's a way that it works. And this book talks about the verses that undergirded the American Revolution. It's not so great that the Bible was used in the uh, Amer American Revolution. When you read about how it was used, you discover that it was actually abused. We actually did a teaching on this topic, why Christians should not ignore the Bible's violent verses. You can go to truerichesradio.com forward slash violent verses. We did a teaching on the importance of this, that we can't ignore the violent verses of the Bible. And we did hint at the Old Testament violence. We did talk about the Old Testament violence and said, what do we do with this? And we definitely want to continue to address that. We're out of time tonight. But as we look back at the Old Testament, and we see the violence in the Old Testament, we see a lot of problems. One of the greatest problems, I would say, in the Old Testament, aside from Genesis 6, where you have obviously God changing his mind, repenting. The word is repent or change his mind. And there's been a lot of commentaries on that. So, well, you know, it doesn't really mean that. Well, that's not what it says. You know, it, it, it clearly says. And then, of course, when you go into Exodus chapter 32, you perhaps have one of the most problematic, um, problematic chapters of the whole Old Testament, uh, Exodus 32. And this is where God where the golden calf incident occurs and where God is about to, to kill all of his people. And Moses says, no, wait a minute. You just brought them all out. Why are you going to turn around and just kill them? Everybody's going to make fun of you. And God says, yeah, you know, that's a good point. And then, and then he, he cools down, but then Moses heats up and Moses goes down and there's a bunch of killing. It's a very strange narrative as you read through it. And what's happening here, of course, is that if you don't if you don't go back to the Old Testament with Jesus, then you're going to be you're not going to know what to do with those passages. You're not going to know what to do. But it's only when we get into the New Testament that we learn that the law was administered not by God Himself, but by angels. That the law was delivered by angels. This is why Jesus says. I mean, that's why in the Old Testament you see Moses says, you know, he and like seventy four other people went up on the mountain, and they saw God. The Bible says they saw God. And then Jesus comes along and says, no man has seen God at any time. Okay, this is shaking people's boots. They're going to put him in a, on a cross pretty soon. Do you understand? That's not so funny. It's not so funny to be coming to Israel and saying, no man has seen God at any time. That's not real funny. That's a quick way to get on a cross. But it does say in the Old Testament, they saw God. Okay, see, there are a lot of things that you have to deal with as you look at the Old Testament. And if we pretend that they're easy, or if we pretend that they're, you know, not important, then we're fooling ourselves. We really do have to deal with these issues. We can't deal with all of them, obviously, in this series, but I do want to provide some general principles and ideas. And the one I'll close with tonight is just simply saying that we have to go to the Old Testament with Jesus that we cannot read the Old Testament thinking that Jesus is not around, 
And we also have to realize that as we read the Old Testament, we're reading about Jesus. And you say, well, where is Jesus in the Old Testament? Well, where is he in the New Testament? He's a slain lamb. Where is he in the book of Revelation? He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay? So he is still a lamb. He was a lamb. He is the lamb. He will always be the slain lamb. He is the slain lamb. That's who Jesus is. You say, well, where's Jesus in the Old Testament? Well, have you looked for any slain lambs? I mean, there were practically, how many thousands of the lambs did they kill? How, how much closer did this make them to God? How did it work out? Why did the prophets say, stop killing animals? Why did Jesus set animals free from the temple? Why did the Israelites think they were supposed to kill animals? Why did the prophets tell them to stop killing animals, but they said, no, wait a minute, God told us to kill animals, and then, but the prophets say, no, I, I never requested this at your hand. And then Jesus lets them go, and notice nobody's killing animals anymore. What's that all about? Did God change? Did God have a taste for? Did he want us to kill animals until Jesus? Did he want us to kill it? Why are the prophets telling us no? Why? Is, why? When we see how many lambs were killed in the Old Testament, it makes sense that Jesus was killed. This is how Israel got closer to God. And it, when they put Jesus on the cross, the thinking at the highest levels of the religious order in Israel was simply this, better for one man to die than for the whole nation to be judged by God. So when they killed the lambs in the Old Testament, they thought they were keeping God off of their back, and they, they extended that right to Jesus. When they killed Jesus, they thought, hey, this is going to keep Rome and all the fury of God off of our back. He was the lamb, forever destroying the idea of killing something to get close to God. Well, we could go a lot longer tonight, but we're not. We're going to close right here. Thank you for attending tonight's teaching. I want to let you know that you can find more about us on truerichesradio.com, where we challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe. We want to hear what you think. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us, truerichesradio.com forward slash contact. We're also on social media. Help us spread the word. Let people know if you like these teachings, if you find them intriguing and helpful, then give us a shout on social media, maybe share it with a friend, and you can always sign up for our email alerts at truerichesradio.com. God bless everybody. We'll see you next time. Take care.